Thank you very much. So I'm here today to talk about our analysis of synchrotron XFs uh, using artificial intelligence. And uh, I, I could have dropped synchrotron from the title and I'll kind of explain why in a few seconds. Okay, well, there we go. Now we're off to the next slide. So yes, this paper was actually just published this week in, in Applied Surface Science. Uh, it's basically Applied Surface Science 547, uh, 149, 059. And uh, there's the DOI. Jeff, a and, quick suggestion. Uh, Jeff, yes. Um, you got a little bit of bandwidth limitations. You might want to mute your video. That tends to help when oh. there's uh, limited bandwidth. Okay, hang on one second. Let me see if I can mute my video. Give me the zoom. Oh, do I have to? Oh, there we go. Stop video. Okay, how'd that work? Uh oh, can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, and I believe okay. your video is uh, is muted now. You're good. Okay, perfect. All right. So now let's come back to this. Okay, are we screen sharing again? You're perfect. Keep going. Sorry for All the interruption. Right. Oh, not a problem. Good to know. All right, so uh, the paper uh, just came out in its final form this week. Uh, so we were uh, glad to see that this was the culmination of a couple of uh, years of work, uh, mainly funded by Idaho National Laboratory. And so this was funded through the INL LDRD program and uh, lab director, Mark Peters. And we have to uh, strongly acknowledge Matt Newville from CARS because without Larch and LM Fit, this would have been crazy to have attempted. This was a, a what I'll call a somewhat underfunded project. So it was done uh, in quite a strange way. Uh, it was funded with LDRD and uh, over a fairly short period of time, so there wasn't enough time to get a PhD grad student and take them all the way through. So how we did this was by hiring a very large number of undergrads and master's students to work on the project. And that's why there are a lot of names. Um, there were just a tremendous number of students who worked with us on this project to get it to completion. We now have a uh, student at Boise State, uh, Andy Lau, who's now working on this project full time and continuing the development. He's a PhD student in computer science there. And I think he's actually here somewhere in the background of the talk today. So uh, one of the issues that we know exists in science, um, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine put together a report there's an issue with reproducibility and replicability in science. And, and this is a major problem because we rely on the scientific foundation to decide what to do next, how to do things. And uh, there, there are a lot of sources of non-replicability. -rep and by improving design, methodology, training, mentoring, um, and using tools for checking analysis and results, we should be able to do better than we actually are. And uh, it's gotten so bad that a number of us who are editors at various journals have seen so many problems uh, that we wrote uh, a little article on the proliferation of faulty analysis. Now we focused on XPS because there's been a lot of work done on XPS, uh, especially by Matt Linford out of uh, Brigham Young University, who has done a tremendous amount of analysis. But basically I, as a journal editor have a form now and we pre-screen all of our papers. And when we see things that come in um, for like XAPS analysis with negative values of intensity, we just send this form out and say, look, you've done some interesting science here, but your analysis is flawed. 
and, and we really can't even consider it until you fix the analysis. Because there's a lot of interesting science that's being done, but it's not being uh, analyzed well or analyzed by people who we would think of are characterization experts. And, and so in, in XPS, it, it's remarkably bad. The numbers are basically that 30% of the data or, or analyses are flawed and completely incorrect. And, and this is a, a big problem. Uh, and it's not just low impact journals. In fact, it's usually worse than the higher impact journals because they're not reviewed as well. They're reviewed for the impact of the science, not necessarily for the science within. And uh, one of the things I, I kind of attribute this to is the black boxing of science. Uh, you know, now we have synthesis and characterization ease of use in many of these tools versus understanding of how they actually work and the massive quantities of data that are now collected using uh, many of the institute techniques. And so with materials characterization, you want to extract information about a sample and you want to create a physically meaningful understanding of the physics and chemistry that contribute to the experimental data. And so in terms of curve fiddling and modeling, the goal is not to create the best mathematical fit, but it's to basically get the most physically meaningful fit. So for XPS, you have a photon coming in, typically an X-ray, you have an electron coming out, you're measuring the electron, and you have peaks in the data that you can clearly see and the idea is to fit these peaks and understand what chemical moieties are actually giving uh, rise to them. And there are a lot of competing things to this. Um, some of those spin orbit coupling, uh, Coster Kronig transitions, resonance, inelastic scattering, they all play a serious role in this. And you have to account for them when you're trying to extract information from the spectrum, from the measured spectrum. And so here's some examples of things that we found in the published literature that are just wrong. Some of them are minor, some of them are fairly major. The, they plotted the, the peaks backwards. Okay, that's and aggravating while you're looking at it, but it's not horrible. But the background goes through the peak. That's bad. That's certainly gonna call into question uh, any of the peak ratios, things like that. Maybe it's a minor effect. Um, they actually don't show the total curve fit probably because the line goes through the peak rather than uh, down here where the background should have been. You have uh, people fitting half of a peak, ignoring the spin orbit splitting, and that gives you the wrong background. So all these peak intensities are incorrect. Uh, these are people who decided not to show the raw data and just showed the peak fits. And they've got widely varying peak widths in here. Now, there are some physical things that could cause that. On the other hand, um, they didn't explain what those physical possibilities were. And in fact, in this case, it's just wrong. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is another one of my favorites where people just label all the noise as peaks. Um, where they just go through the tables of binding energies and nope, there's a peak there, peak there. Now, again, what's important to understand here is these all made it past peer review. This is all in the published literature. So if there's a novice user who comes in and sees these, these things, they can easily propagate this down the chain. Now, XAPS, in our opinion, was easier to address because 
the functions are all signs and they're readily calculated by FEP. Uh, they don't have the, the same range of peak parameters that XPS does, the all the different line shapes, all the different backgrounds that you can have. So we thought that the first thing we would do is try and use an algorithm that could do XFs first and then later on expand it to other techniques. So ultimately our goal is to be able to take inputs from some things like the materials project, input that into FEF, use our genetic algorithms, uh, couple that to the beamline experiments or any XFs measurement and uh, go through results and, and try and make as the analysis computer do as much of this as possible. So most of the work that we've been doing uh, has been uh, synchrotron based at sector 10, uh, the materials research collaborative access uh, team beamline at the advanced photon source. But we recently added an easy XAPS, which is a lab based system. Now, unfortunately this was installed just before COVID uh, hit and this has really limited our ability to utilize this system, but when I talked about um, taking synchrotron out of the name, when we look at it, I think the easy XAPS is actually going to be a very important system. Almost all universities now have a photo emission system. Those cost on the order of one to one and a half million dollars. Given the cost difference between a photo emission system and an easy XAPS, I think we're going to see easy XFs and lab-based systems uh, for XFs proliferate wildly. Um, and, and so I think it will become easier and easier to do XFs that will allow more and more people to do it. And it will also lead to fewer and fewer experts doing the analysis. And that can cause big problems. Okay, when we first started with this, we would synthesize and combine paths. So we would take synthetic paths. This, these are paths from copper with these specific values, uh, S0 squared Ni is one, delta Ri 0.02, sigma squared Ir 0.03, E naught 0.1. And we would synthesize these values and have our algorithm identify the paths that were uh, actually contributing. So we started with synthetic data that had no noise. Now, the idea of using genetic algorithms is actually a fairly old idea. Uh, and uh, I use Bruce Bunker as an example. Over his career, he recently retired. He trained 24 people to analyze XAPS data. And XAPS analysis does have a certain level of art to it. Uh, we've all looked at spectra of backgrounds subtracted by students and go, yeah, no, that's not right. Uh, and, and we have a feel for that. And the students, it takes some time to get that same feel. But uh, these genetic algorithms uh, were put together by uh, Bunker, Damakis, and Keshvili and used to uh, analyze um, metalloproteins, bio, uh, biological systems. And, and so they did a lot of this work in 2004 and 2006, but it never really caught on, especially back then, uh, we're, we're talking uh, 15, 16 years ago, the computer skills, uh, weren't really there to make this work. Um, but the availability of computational clusters and multiprocessing computers really make this idea practical now. All right, so we started with human assisted machine learning. So basically we tell them the machine learning system, the elements presence, the structures tell uh, present, and we calculate the paths using FEF based on that. So a genetic algorithm is actually kind of based on evolution. It uses deterministic randomness. So you initialize a population with just random numbers. 
based on, on, the, on the past that you have. Uh, then you breed them. And so ideally over time, you will uh, get the best, the most fit parents. To avoid getting stuck in, in local uh, maxima, the uh, fitness function, you end up mutating. Uh, so there's some random mutations that you do and you evaluate figuring out which of the parents and offspring are best and you continue those on to the next generation. So the things that matter are the population size, the number of generations, your fitness scores, how you choose to kill off the weakest members, uh, how you mate the strongest members, how many children should they have, um, how do you randomly mutate uh, the members, and how do you stop this calculation? What's your ending criteria? So for mutation, we use a Rechenberg algorithm, which dynamically alters the mutation rate depending on the number of successful mutations. Uh, the fitness is based on a reduced chi-squared. Um, and obviously the toughest thing we have is evaluating the error on each point. So right now we're setting uh, EI equal to one, which overweights some of the noisier data. So we use a two-pass routine where we calculate the path contributions and we can remove or add paths depending on what is showing up. And um, here, here's an example of a, an early on part of the fit, but there's a peak here that's missing. And that peak is missing because the human who put together these paths, which was me, could never actually figure out what pass really contributed strongly there. But that was something that the algorithm was able to figure out on its own when we let it do the full, you know, when we started with just a small number of paths, it obviously couldn't tell that something was there when it was. All right, so for error analysis, uh, we use a global random analysis for the genetic algorithm routine. And this is a statistical error. And this was developed by Red House. And, and they did this for quantification of neutron energy spectrum. So basically we do this by uh, doing a, a large number of calculations. We almost never do less than 10 runs of the genetic algorithm. We prefer to do 100, uh, not to say there's some magic number with 100, but 100 gives us a large variation in, in the randomness. And so when we do 100 calculations, we change the number of population, we change the completeness criteria, we change the mutation rate, the population size, the number of parents. And this gives us a very large probe of the parameter of phase space. Okay, we started with simulated data with known theoretical paths. And the genetic algorithm was always able to reproduce those. So it, it really didn't buy as much. The question was how it would do on experimental spectra with actual noise, simple molecules, crystalline solids, and most importantly, mixtures, because it's very hard to do mixtures in many cases. And the example we have for mixtures are operando batteries. All right, uh, this might be a good time to. Uh, Ask, stop and ask, see if there are any questions. Hey, Jeff, um, uh, there were, uh, you're still here, Jeff, yes? Yeah, I'm still here. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, there are. Just that uh, you stopped sharing your screen and there wasn't, um, oh, uh, I was worried you got dropped. Yeah. No, no, no. I just wanted to see. I thought it might be a good time to break. Uh, because yeah, no, it, it, it is. So uh, a couple of a couple of questions. First, um, what are some uh, some other fields where uh, GA has been used in this way to uh, deal with statistical inferences? Uh, it's used in a lot of places. Uh, like I said, the, the, the big example that we found was in uh, neutron energy analysis, okay. which was really interesting. And they had what was really nice about the work that they had done, and, and that reference was on that, that last slide, so anybody can go back and look for it. 
but uh, they had done a lot of the error analysis work. And one of the mm -hmm. biggest problems with uh, machine learning techniques is trying to work out what the errors are. Uh, because it, it is kind of based on randomness. Mm -hmm. and, and so assessing errors was one of the hardest problems that we had to work on. Okay. Unfortunately, they had done a lot of work. All right. Um, uh, Simon Baer, uh, can you unmute? You have a question. Hi, hey, Terry. Um, so I'm going back to... You're starting off with XPS, and that was brought yes. back lots of horror memories for me. And I remember an ACS meeting I was at a couple of years ago, and I sat for a whole day of ambient pressure XPS presentations. And they would put spectra up, and they would fit six, seven, eight different species under a peak with no explanation. And somehow that has become accepted Whereas in the XAPS community, if you try to publish something like that, you'd be torn apart. Can you give any sort of insight as to how these things propagate? How does that become the norm? I, I think it becomes the norm because uh, a whole lot of people have access to XPS right now. Like I said, it, it exists at almost every other... Um, and basically every other university on the planet has an XPS system. So there are a tremendous number of people actually making those measurements. And typically at a university, they have one person running the instrument who has some semblance of an idea of how to do the peak fitting, how to do the work. And uh, they, they can't fit all the data. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody from, uh, uh, a university, uh, I'll just say a, a, a large university in the South, and, and they said to keep their XPS system running, they have to measure somewhere on the order of 40 samples a day. A and there's no way a single person can analyze that. So they make the measurements, they turn it loose to the grad students, and once something gets published poorly, it's in the literature, you look it up, you can find that, and then, oh, well, that's what we should do. It's in the literature and you cite that and, and you duplicate it, reproduce it. So it's, uh, it is a little different. And um, I, I, I do have some fears as XFs becomes easier to do that the same thing will happen in the XFs community. Because once things get out there, it, it, it's there and um, yeah, I, I just think that's the problem. And like I said, it, it was so bad in photo mission uh, where 40% of the analyses are wrong. And, and I can actually send you a link to, to a recently published paper. Uh, but, but in the XFs community, a, a lot of people got together and recently published a huge number of how-to guides on how to do the fitting better. And so those came out over the last year in the Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology. But they also published the, the study showing that, um, you know, basically the high impact journals do a terrible job. The editors took out the journal names, which was a little disappointing. I think that should have been called out. But yes, it's a big problem in XPS, no okay. question. Um, moving on, Adam but, Clark. But I do see it. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, Adam Clark, you have a question? Hi, yeah. So I'm uh, Adam Clark, being one scientist at SuperXS at the Swiss Light Source. Um, I have two questions yep. in one, really. So have you ever heard of um, another similar kind of approach, which I have aware of? So EVAX. So it's an evolutionary algorithm for excess analysis written primarily by Yanis Timoshenko. Yep. And no, this well, uses reverse Monte Carlo with genetic algorithms. So how does your approach differ from, from this approach? So uh, we, we don't do anything with reverse Monte Carlo. So this is just a straight genetic algorithm. No, no use of Monte Carlo at all, or reverse Monte Carlo. There, there are times when reverse Monte Carlo is going to give you better results than what we get. There are times when uh, what we do is 
probably going to be simpler to, to get and accomplish. Uh, reverse Monte Carlo sometimes has trouble with mixtures. Uh, ours works pretty well with mixtures. Yeah. The, you had a second, uh, you had a second question, Adam? I was kind of two in one of, of if, oh, it, okay. <laughs> if, if, if so, then, then how do you compare to reverse Monte Carlo? But yeah, I agree with the mixtures. The mixtures in reverse Monte Carlo is challenging, but they are working on that as well. So. Yeah, no, no. There, in, in fact, I, I don't claim that this should be the end all be all program. We, we just submitted a paper that didn't use reverse Monte Carlo, but used Monte Carlo. And then we calculated the XFs from that. Uh, the, the, there are room for a, a large number of these fitting programs and techniques. And frankly, you'll get better results with some systems from some than with others. There's no question. All right, you should please continue, Jeff. All right, so uh, let me try and share screen and then I'll, or no, let me stop the video, then share the screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can still see me and hear me. So simple molecules, uh, these are all very uh, simple systems. Uh, containing technetium, TCCl6, 2 minus, TCOCl4 uh, minus, TCNCl4 minus. Um, they all have at least uh, four chlorines, and then you have a double bonded oxygen or a triple bound nitrogen. And so technetium's in a different oxidation state in all of these materials. So TCCl6, the distorted octahedron, and uh, we run the fitting parameters. We get the fit to the data. This is dominated by the technetium chlorine peak. And there are some paths that don't contribute much, some paths that contribute very significantly. And, and I think there's a lot of interesting physics that can be gleaned from this. We're not sure how to get all of it out yet, one of the things that we've really found in applying this algorithm, it, it, especially when we're working with thin films, we've done some UO2 thin films that we had trouble um, really figuring out what we've done. But we've noticed when we run the genetic algorithm, all the in-plane contributions disappeared. And we think that is because, or what that implies is that our UO2 films were actually much more epitaxial than we thought. Uh, one of the problems with working with a lot of radioactive materials is the systems don't always have all the uh, nice growth monitoring tools. So in, in the UO2 deposition system, there's no read. You can't easily make me measurements of the film as it's growing. And so we had made the assumption that it probably wasn't a very good epitaxial film, but now it looks like uh, there was a significant effect probably from the polarization vector of the light causing those paths to disappear. And, and that, uh, that actually told us something about the film. So I, we think going through some of these things will be interesting to try and figure out why some of these paths disappear and why some don't. All right, so uh, one of the things that we've done uh, with this code is really focus on the outputs. Uh, we wanted to make sure, especially um, for novice users uh, who we think will use this code, that it exports everything they need. So for example, these figures are all exported from the code and the tables are all exported from the code as LaTeX. So all you do is copy the LaTeX, put, paste it into a paper, and your table will be correct based. You don't have to retype any of these things in. So we've added a lot of these features for ease of use um, and, and reporting purposes. Uh, TCOCL4 is a distorted square pyramidal, uh, 1.61 angstroms on the TCO, 2.31 on the technetium chlorine. And uh, the, you can clearly see the TCL path is much weaker than the strong TCCL path. 
and the dominant uh, multiple scattering pass also uh, are the technetium with chlorine. This is um, almost exactly the same result that we got by hand when we did this and published this for the first time about 10 years ago. Uh, TCN Cl4, uh, same thing. The nitrogen is actually even a slightly weaker path, again, dominated by the TCCl. And uh, again, the structures match up with what we did in, uh, almost exactly when this analysis was done by hand. Then we went on to crystalline solids where we looked at hafnium oxide and copper. I'm not going to talk about hafnium oxide here because we'll be here forever. Uh, Copper is an FCC metal, 12 nearest uh, neighbors at 2.55 angstrom, 6 at 3.61. And here, uh, this is uh, Matt Newville's large fitting example data of 10K, 50K, 150K, and 298K copper. And what we've done is our two pass optimization. We start with a very large number of pass. Uh, we run through the algorithm once, see which paths don't contribute, take those paths out, and then uh, uh, rerun the algorithm again, just using those strong paths. We get the fits to the data. And we can see uh, the data is very well re reproduced. Um, and we get our output parameters. Now the important parameters here and what's changing the most is actually the Dubai-Waller factor sigma squared. And just to save on some time here, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly and, and come to this plot. So here's our plot with the single scattering pass. These are pass 1, 2, 5, 16, 28, and 42. And we can all see the increasing trend in the Dubai Waller factor with temperature. So it does find this. Right, this. All right, can everybody see the screen again? Yes, you're good to go. Go for it. Oh, I should probably turn off the video again. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, compounds, uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, Illinois Tech has a huge program on evaluating different materials for use in, li use in lithium ion batteries. Uh, tin is a potential replacement for cobalt in these systems. And you basically uh, take XF spectra while charging and discharging the battery. And it becomes problematic because it's really hard for humans to analyze all of this data. So this was a good test of our machine learning code. Uh, so we measured the 10 k edge XFs versus battery state of charge. Um, when they did it in person, they summed all the like cycles to improve the signal to noise. Of course, they didn't tell us this. They just gave us the data when we analyzed it. So we had no idea when the system cycled and when we were doing the analysis. They chose not to analyze the transient decay cycle, but they had identified important paths, the tin oxygen, a tin lithium, and a tin tin path that were important in, in, in the spectrum. So when we got the data, I suggested to the students who did the analysis that they should probably sum 10 consecutive spectra to improve the signal to noise. Um, we didn't know that they didn't analyze the transient decay cycle, so we analyzed that. Um, we utilized the paths they gave us, which were the tin oxygen, the tin lithium, and the tin tin. And as we fit, we found that there was also a tin sulfur path that was important to fit the transient data. So in the as-loaded material, there was an extra tin sulfur path that had to be included. So this was a blind test. We had no idea when the battery was cycled and we were able to clearly observe the cycles in the data. 
So in an operanda battery, 10 oxygen, 10 lithium, 10 sulfur, 10 tin were the important. You can see there are a few species that just decay away and stay fairly flat. Um, so the 10 oxygen bond, the, the oxygen's uh, contaminant from making this an air, it decays away. The tin sulfur really doesn't cycle. It, it just decays away. So the, the tin sulfur compound that they start with is completely destroyed under the operation of the battery. And then you get these tin lithium, uh, a, a decaying away tin lithium peak. And then you have uh, cycling tin lithium. And you can see that basically uh, you have formation of 10 nanoparticles in the material. And as you're charging it uh, over time and discharging, you either intercalate lithium into this and break some of the tin tin bonds, or you're removing them and the lithium and reforming the tin tin bonds. So you can really see the cycling of the battery and you can see the decaying of the transient species. Uh, this was a very good result for the battery system. But what was interesting, like I said, was when they did the analysis as people, they took the, all these spectra in the tops of the cycles, all in the bottom of the cycles, and summed them up and took one analysis point from each cycle, one here, here, here. But here, even though the data was quite noisy, we were still able to extract the cycles and the chemistry out of it. This is one of the uh, spectra that we analyzed. And so it was a good thing that the undergrads had run this and they didn't show me the data first because had they actually showed me this, I would have told them not to waste their time analyzing it. Uh, not all of the spectra were this bad, but uh, the ads as loaded was pretty reasonable. It was easy to get a, a fit for that. But uh, I, it was clear that there was a missing tin sulfur bond in these cases. Um, the discharge date, the, this was actually the, the worst system to analyze. In the charge state, uh, there were more peak oscillations, and, and so it was a little better. So the uncharged or the discharge state was always had the highest um, error associated with the uh, data. But you can still extract the trends even with horribly noisy data. And that was data that I, had I met, seen that, would not have chosen to analyze as a person. And so we think this is one of the strengths of this uh, algorithm is it does work with horribly noisy data when the data is only good over a small range of case space. Obviously the smaller the case space range you have, the fewer the independent points and you have to be much more worried about exceeding the Nyquist limit. The other thing that was important to us is because we're trying to fit basically sine functions was showing that you couldn't fit everything, that you couldn't just randomly adjust the data to, until it actually covered everything. And so here's an example of using uh, this to exclude data. So this was a nuclear fuel that had been fissioned, and it was a fissioned uh, triso fuel. A triso is a, is a modern nuclear fuel that the fuel and cladding are kind of mixed together. So the concern was that there was uranium dioxide, UO2, migrating out into the fuel cladding, which wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. And so we measured XFs on this, and we tried to fit it with UO2, and we couldn't reproduce the spectrum. And, and that really is telling us that UO2 is not there, and we actually do know what this is. It's more uranium carbide and uranium silicide, not, not UO2. But when we look at this, we can look at the data and we can see it's completely unphysical. So our first UO paths don't exist, but then it tells you there's a large contribution from the multiple scattering path that depends on the first path. 
So you can look at things like this and go, okay, that is not possible, even if that was a good fit to the data, which it's not, but you can quickly exclude materials because you can try a lot of models rapidly with this, especially if you have a large cluster on which you can run the calculations. So basically we can effectively fit XAPS data using a set of FEF9 calculated theoretical standards using a genetic algorithm. This works on both high performance computing uh, systems and desktop machines. The job control software on a cluster in HPC is really, really convenient. We're trying to duplicate this in Python. And uh, basically you can get a reasonable fit depending on what your system is in a fraction of a day on a desktop machine. So when I did a demonstration at the Canadian Light Source a few months ago, we actually did the uh, technetium fitting in real time on a desktop machine can be done. It's better if you have access to a cluster can, and can run these things simultaneously. Now to go back to XPS, uh, we basically- you want to, to uh, Jeff, maybe um, yeah. would this be a good time for a break? Oh, sure. You, okay, great, for a second break, all right. So um, yeah. uh, uh, is this sort of, it feels like it closes off some of your uh, your XFs analysis and there's a few questions. Yep. Um, Matthew Marcus, okay. you had yeah. a question? Let me, let me see if I can see the chat window. D don't bother, I'll call on people. Oh, it's too, too okay. distracting, right. it's too distracting. Perfect, um, okay. Um, Matthew, you have out. a question? Yeah, so there's one during, uh, in, the, in this genetic analysis, uh, what, do you, uh, what are the genes? Uh, uh, is it the path parameters or is it structural? It is the path parameters. So let me, let me pick one of these things here, something hopefully with a few of them. Right, so that seems to me that that would be, uh, it would leave things kind of too loose because the, pa the path parameters should depend on a smaller number of structural parameters. Uh, like for instance, the path length of multiple scattering depends on the it depends on the structural parameters and therefore are tied to the single scattering. It, they can indeed, but uh, so theoretically, if you really knew what everything was, you could add more constraints to the data. We, we haven't done that. Uh, that, that hasn't been what we focused on because it works, in our opinion, well enough for the most part. Uh, and right now, this matches what we think of as being more conventional XFs analysis, where you, at least when we're doing analysis, we typically don't constrain everything. Uh, it could be constrained, and we actually think that's something we're going to add, if I can scroll back up. Yeah, and similarly, uh, there's the uh, D sig squares, which, uh, which at least in the weaker paths tend to be pretty floppy. And I was wondering how you dealt with that. It, it, it is all, um, all determined by the algorithm. There's, there's nothing locked in right now. Yeah, so it, it's basically a fitting, a, a fitting parameter. I find that nothing is. Yeah, when you do a regular, I uh, say uh, Artemis fit, yeah, then uh, it'll sometimes uh, just uh, blow up the D sig squared to essentially exclude a path. Yeah, uh, for, the, for this, it, it, we we have not observed that. But again, we tend to to limit the range to more plausible fitting parameters, whereas with uh -huh. Artemis, it, it, those values can blow up. So, so we take, take the concept of, we're going to limit the range on all of these parameters. So, so they are limited to things that we think are physically plausible for the majority of systems. So you can't get a negative value of intensity, for example. It's just not, not allowed in the system. But the, each of these are the set of four genes for each, uh, each system. Uh -huh. I, don't, I hope you can see that. Yeah. Right. So there, there's basically a gene for each of the seven paths. Uh -huh. Okay, I think we were, uh, um, uh, we're, we're good on that. There was a question from Adam Clark. 
Uh, yeah, again. Um, so you showed a nice example actually with the battery stuff on a data set where you had several hundred um, spectra. Um, so for me, when I'm collecting data, I, I'm often collecting sub-second temporal resolution, so I can end up with millions of spectra per, per experiment. Um, how well does your algorithm manage to scale for such large quantities of data and how long would it take to run? Uh, so the analysis uh, for there, ba ba for, well, that was the wrong one. This, this one here, uh, actually, let me pull that up. Uh, so I, I, this was roughly 500 spectra. And so the 500 spectra on a 20 machine cluster took about four hours. It, it was much faster on a, a large number of nodes on a high performance computing supercomputer at IML. So it depends totally on what uh, machines you have access to. Can I ask a related question, which is uh, in Adam's situation, one expects that su successive spectra are somewhat closely related, that we're looking at uh, uh, potentially incremental changes. Could that be used yes. to seed the, um, the next implementation of, uh, of the GA so that prior information from the previous spectra could accelerate convergence? Or is that cheating? That's already in the code. Okay. It wasn't in the code when we ran this. Uh -huh. We noticed that, that it was stupid not to put that in. Okay. So that is in there now. Um, and, and more importantly, it will also, it, it's a smart routine. Uh, you know, well, I'm not sharing my video so nobody can see my hands. But if it hits the end of a range, it expands the range. Okay. So, All right. so uh, I, it, as you're going, uh, it, if it if it's, uh, is adjusting a parameter all the way to one side of the fitting range. It says, okay, I've, I've hit the edge of the range. This can't be right. So I need to slide my window over further. So it adjusts that, but it, it does that. Uh, but we've never rerun this data with that routine to see how much of a speed up it actually does. Okay. We should probably. Adam, you had a follow-up it sounded like? Uh, yeah, so what you're saying is for very large data sets, you'll be needing a, a very large computational power to be able to deal with these kind of problems. Um, if so, you have it, yeah, you're much better off. You, could, you can certainly do it uh, on a local machine. It's just going to take you a, a large amount of time to do it. So yeah, you're much better off if you have a cluster. Even 20, 30 node cluster is a great speed up. Okay, we have uh, questions um, uh, also from Yang Han, Renee Bess, but I'm gonna ask them to hold their questions for the end and we'll let Jeff uh, right. uh, go ahead and, and finish up. All right. Oh, fortunately, I'm almost finished. Uh, all right, hopefully everybody can see that again. So, um, we basically uh, didn't want to risk destroying Matt Newville's um, code. So we forked Larch and LMFit, and we started adding in functions for XPS. Uh, what we think of as an advantage here is that uh, the genetic algorithm code is about 80% uh, of our code. Um, and so about 80% of our total code base can be reused for XPS. So that means we don't have to do uh, more debugging on the genetic algorithm. We, we debug the genetic algorithm once, we write all the unit testing for it, and then its code base can be applied to other materials characterization techniques. And so here's an XPS spectrum, and this is our first XPS bit uh, using the exact same code base just adding in different functions for the background and different functions for the peaks. So um, what we're, we're happy to see that this should be expandable to other techniques. And we think that um, by going out and, and, and we're working now to develop databases, work with existing databases, and we have a nice team that are working on um, 
going out and extracting information from the literature and verifying that everything is there. So we, we think this is extensible beyond XFs to a lot of other de techniques. And we think we can you know, help to solve some of these problems with people fitting things with 100,000 peaks, that, that just unphysical fits. Um, so basically we think that AI techniques certainly have the potential to lighten the burden on human analysts. And uh, our path forward, we would like to take uh, more of the human out so ideally we would just be able to identify what elements are present in the material we would then use artificial intelligence uh, a neural net to identify uh, the chemical species that are likely to form feed that into fef9 calculate the potential pass and then let the genetic algorithm run to determine the pass and materials uh, and then finally you could work backwards and have the neural net identify the structures from the past that are present in the data. So we think that'll be the next step of the evolution of our program. And uh, obviously we're willing to train people on this. So if you would like us to do a demonstration of the actual code, uh, we can do that for you. So if anybody wants us to show them how to use the code, um, we'll be glad to uh, to work with you and do, set up a demonstration. All right, so that Dan, was excellent. Any questions? It was an excellent talk, Jeff. It's really fascinating. Um, I'll start with a question. If you uh, scroll back to your slide about taking humanity out of XFs analysis right near the end, uh, maybe second uh, from last slide or, or such. This one, yes. Uh, it surprised me because it seems to take out the possibility of putting in um, prior information about structure. And um, uh, it, 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 am I understanding that correctly? Uh, no, there's, there's no reason you couldn't add a, a specific structure in. But, but frankly, one of the problems that we have is we tend to be looking at... Uh, uh, so I, I do a lot of studies of radiation damage in materials. And so we might find that we have 15 different elements and the concept then becomes which of these things are actually coming together in the high radiation environment forming compounds. Um, if you look with microscopy, historically everything's been determined to be an alloy. Okay, so I have... Uh, iron, carbon, uh, uranium, palladium, all in this spot. So obviously I have a metallic iron, carbon, palladium alloy. But what we found is we've done XFs on these things. Well, you really have um, uranium carbide. And I think this is, I think this is off. I think like this that. is uh, maybe off the point of where I wanted the question to go. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, uh, as we all know, the hard thing about XFs is the inverse problem is ill-defined. And so you have That's to, um, yeah. uh, and so the usual way of addressing an ill-defined inverse problem is you impose enough prior information to stabilize the inversion. And so uh, I'm surprised yeah. that you have nothing about that here because, I mean, uh, I understand there are some systems that are so, so hard that you may not be sure, you may not have guesses you believe but the, so, it no, looks, so for go us, ahead, that goes more back to, to this, to the exclusion. Okay. And, and so for us, the, the idea is just to, to run everything. And, and you'll get some that just can't possibly be the answer. And so, yes, if, if you do have a good feel, like in the lithium ion battery cases, mm -hmm. where they knew it was a, a lithium tin, you, you can certainly put that in. But if you have no idea... That's fine. Yeah, I, under, I understand. Be able to go to the phase diagram, figure out what might be plausible, and then run a bunch okay. of things. Okay. It's just this, um, uh, it's this step of formalizing the prior information, which is why it was so hard for that earlier work of, of uh, Crappy and Cass 
on a Bayesian inversion of XFs 20 years ago or so. It was so hard to make that work formalizing it. And that's been such a nice feature of the supervised machine learning from, uh, say, Timoshenko and collaborators, that they yeah. formalized yeah. the prior yeah. information by the choice of the training data set. And so I was surprised not to yeah. see some strong statement about how you're going to uh, put prior information in that other slide. But I understand yeah, no, um, this, uh, here where it is you're doing that. Does, yeah, this does not require the prior. Uh, this is an un, a, a, a non-training. So there's no training involved here at all. No, I, uh, I understand. So, okay. so yeah, so, uh, so our idea is actually the opposite. Don't rule things out, run them and test and, and see if you can rule them out. Afterwards. afterwards. Okay, I understand. So it's post facto prior information. So uh, whatever the right Latinization, prior. whatever the right I, I don't know is for that. <laughs> but, but that's the, right. uh, the idea is to run all of these things and then afterwards rule out. Because okay. usually it's very clear like in this case, mm -hmm. uh, where you have single scattering paths that don't exist with multiple scattering paths, it's really easy to rule this out. Okay. I want to try to get to two more questions. Uh, Yang Ha, yeah. you had a question? Yeah. Jeff, great talk as yeah. always. Hello? So Thank yeah, I, I really like your, your tin oxide story. So it actually shows two extreme end. One end, you show that uh, if you just feed the raw data to, to your code, it can give you some reasonable results, even though the data itself looks noisy. And on the other side, uh, other end, you show uh, you, you told your student to add in a thin sulfur path from your own intuition. So I want you to make a comment on like how human input can can impact these kind of like fittings and with the development of well, these. So, yeah. so basically we weren't able to get good fits without the tin sulfur peak in, in the transition period. Uh, so in, in this period where you're having decay, if you did not include this tin sulfur peak, you just couldn't get a good fit to the data. And so, yes, the, 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 the intuition was, well, it had to be tin oxide or tin sulfur because those were the only other two materials present. So that was really the only uh, human input was to pick what this. Now, it, when the group who did this work, they started the analysis out here in like cycle 125, something like that. So they didn't look at the initial decay transient period of what was going on in the battery. So they, they only analyzed the higher out. So by that point, the tin sulfur peak had already decayed away. So it was really only important very early on in the data. And so that's why they didn't see it. And that's why we did see it. And they just didn't look at the, right, at the, at the same right, fitting range. They decided that they weren't interested in the transient. And, and there's valid reason for that because you care about the operating conditions of the batteries and it's always going to be cycled once. So, but uh, yes, yeah, so there is right now still a lot of human uh, intuition that's still being involved because people are still choosing the structures. And obviously I think for our routine, we would like to get rid of that where you just say, okay, I know here we have tin, oxygen, sulfur, lithium, what's there? Uh, and I think we can get to that point. Okay, Renee, you have a question? Yeah, nice talk. Uh, it's really a nice tool and uh, would definitely take a look to this deeper. And I have a question about the human impact in the exact signal extraction, you know, uh, normalization and so on may have an impact of the, um, on the feeding process. And it happens regularly that you have to go back to the extraction and then do the feeding again. Uh, is there, is your algorithm uh, sensitive to that or, or not? So uh, let me exit this. 
let me pull this up. So here's actually our code running. And, and in here we have this background and uh, subtraction. So you can adjust the background parameters. And so what we do, uh, and I didn't talk about it here, but we tend to use a variety of uh, background parameters and run this over and over again um, to study how the background. Now it's not automated. We this is something we should probably automate. Our, our new release coming out next week adds Fef 8.5 light into the code. So all you have to do is add a, a, a Fef.INP file. Uh, it handles the mixtures by putting all the all the mixtures in its own. Uh, all the FEF input files in, its, in their own directories and then pulls those in, into the code as needed. Um, that, that's all being released next week. We're adding that to the GUI. So that's actually not in this GUI. That's all been uh, tested and unit tested with, with the command line version of this. Uh, the, the GUI we consider still kind of under beta. We're, we're adding more features uh, but but how the GUI basically creates an input file that our command line code runs. But yeah, so we highly recommend that you change all the background parameters and see how that affects your data. Because again, especially if you're running this on a cluster, it's just submitting another job. Very good. Uh, last you. question then is from Adam Clark. Hi, uh, again, one more question. So. How well does the algorithm deal with potentially highly correlating or co-evolving parameters such as coordination numbers and Debye Waller factors, particularly in reactive chemistry for nanomaterials, where these parameters can often be very difficult to, to refine individually? Yeah, right now it doesn't, it treats them separately. We're, we're working on adding uh, more and more constraints to the data to, to cover other conditions, but right now it just fits them individually.